thankful to be with each and every one of you today. Ask an interest in your prayers. Please continue to pray for me. If you have your Bibles with you and you would like to turn with me, please turn with me over to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 17. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body's body the marks of the Lord Jesus. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Lord, be with me. I'd like to draw our attention to the subject of the marks of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? If you look in which that it talks about the mark, so you can look in different um, writings from different um, authors. You could look in John Gill to get a historical uh, uh, description. I don't use John Gill as far as doctrinal. He, I believe he's off on some doctrinal things. But as far as uh, some historical things, and you can say some historical things, that he goes into the marks in which different ones had received marks for their beatings. And he looks at the beatings that Apostle Paul had received. And you remember that when Paul is brought to Caesar and is brought to different ones, and they have, he questioned him and he talks about what all he's gone through for the cause of Christ. <clears throat> I believe that that's part of one of the marks, many marks of the Lord Jesus. Sufferings is which our Lord and Savior went through. But I also reminded of a mark I had listened to a sermon by Elder Sonny Piles talking about seals and Marks, brands, and many years ago, I believe it was 1982 that that sermon was preached. Uh, listening to that got me thinking about uh, how that we have been uh, sealed by the Holy Ghost. You remember the scripture teaches that uh, ye have been sealed by the Holy Ghost. You remember that, that... Uh, a seal that when the king was putting something uh, into writing and into law, he would take his ring, his seal, and they would heat that up and then they would take it and they would press it in, into the wax. Or they would have wax and they would heat the wax and the wax would drop onto the paper and it would be wet and they'd take the ring and he would press his seal into the wax and it sealed it. Today that we have, uh, you know, <clears throat> pieces of paper that we have to go uh, to the city or the state or the county, different places, and they have the seal, that they crimp that seal down on that paper and it presses it and it, it compresses pressure and it makes a seal on that paper. It stretches that paper and, and all those grooves and you can read the impression of that seal that's on that paper. <clears throat> it's not like something that somebody has at home and it's ready available. It's not something that people are able to just go out and get just anywhere. You say, Brother Brad, I could go on Amazon and I can order me a seal uh, pretty close to it. Yeah, you probably could. But I guarantee you, when it comes to a seal in which these people have a seal at a city, state, or county levels, or, or even the United States uh, federal level, there are special seals that is made by special people, just like the ones that make the dollar bills or the coins, the money uh, currency, that when they make that, there is a special stamp. There is a special die. And when I mean die, not talking about colorization, but it's a die stamp that stamps that into whatever it's supposed to be. And they know what is real and what is not real. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, I believe that when Apostle Paul is talking here in verse 17, he says, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, 
for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brothers and sisters, what is he talking about there in the very first portion of this verse? From henceforth, let no man trouble me. And there's a pause. Let no man trouble me. What did he deal with with the Galatians? There was a time in which Apostle Paul had gone over into Galatia. And as he went into Galatia, he started to uh, do his work there in Galatia and labor among the Galatians as he preached there and the ch God blessed him there and blessed the churches there. There were those that were round about there were the Jews. Uh, there were those that were so-called conversions. There were those that were Christians. Uh, but brothers and sisters, they came around from behind. They were like the thief, the enemy uh, that uh, slips in from behind that tries to go and get into the house. Uh, my dear friends, that's what they were doing, slipping in behind in the back door or the back window. And they were causing problems and they were causing uh, issues and questions of Paul there at the churches. And as God had blessed Paul to preach the gospel and power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit, they were causing questions. They were causing hardships. They would bring up certain things and they would manipulate it. And they would make up lies. They would make up stories. What do you remember there in Galatians? You can find that in different portions, if you study from the very beginning of um, the book of Galatians, you'll find where Apostle Paul had been preaching there and been blessed. And then he gets to a point that he says, who hath bewitched you, who hath beguiled you? My dear friends, bewitching is like these old witches that you see, that they go out and they mesmerize with their sorcery. Or the sorcerers mesmerized with their sorcery. You think that people don't exercise witchcraft? Think again. People love to mesmerize people with their suave ways, the whining and dining people, their smooth words. The words is like honey. And they get smooth with the way they do things. And that's Satan's way to deceive God's very elect people. That's the way Satan likes to work, to deceive God's people. He sends in false prophets, false teachers, men of falsehood, and they come around through the back door. They're not open. They're not uh it's like Elder Sonny Pyle said, they like they like uh, wolves that likes to go get the sheep. Likes to go get those that are off by themselves and grab them by their ear. And then when they have children, young ones, when they can't get the old ones, they grab the young ones by their ear and pull them aside. Brothers and sisters, haven't you seen where people love to take them? aside they'll be off in a corner somewhere they don't like eating with the other people they don't like fellowshipping with the other people they like taking them off aside i knew people that way they take them aside and they go have a little meeting over here and they be whispering in the ear and they grab them by the ear have you ever seen that People aren't, they can't come to the person and talk to the person. They have to go take those that's off to their self aside and slip in. But there's a, a mark there that is upon the cattle. That who owns that cattle or who owns them, whoever that master is, that they see who it is. There's a lot of things called branding. If they will brand cattle, the owners will brand the cattle. They have a mark upon their flocks so that they know 
who owns them. But not only that, but the scripture teaches there in John that when he calls them, they follow him. Why? When our Heavenly Father calls us and we follow him, we know him because he what first knows knew us. That's grace. When the work of the Holy Ghost has done a mighty work inside of you and has quickened you and has changed you, it's because of the great love that God has had for you before the foundation of the world. Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22, it says, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Ephesians 4.30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You notice this, that it's talking about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that has sealed us. There, we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. There has been a mark that has been made there. We have been marked by God, by the work of the Holy Ghost. We have been sealed inwardly. And he knows us by that mark. Apostle Paul's reminding them there in our opening text that there's marks. There's something that he has that's, that's a great mark there that he appreciates. And he says, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. If God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, they three be one, then that's how, if the, if the Holy Ghost has made a mark inwardly in you, you have been sealed by the work of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit has done a work. The Holy Spirit has done a work inwardly in you. You have been quickened. You have been changed. Amen. You remember that in the Old Testament times that it was told unto them they were to be circumcised. Why? Because that was obedience. Circumcision was a, a way of cleanliness in those days. And brothers and sisters, I'm reminded of a time and period of time in which Moses had told the Lord, I have uncircumcised lips. That was when Moses was being called out uh, to do a great work to go unto Pharaoh and to ask that his people be let go. And my dear friends, he said that uh, he was of uncircumcised lips, that he was one uh, <clears throat> slow of speech, too. How many times have we thought that we're not good enough, that a child of grace that's been called unto the ministry may think, well, I'm not good enough. I can't, re uh, I can't remember all of the scripture that I need to remember. I may be slow in some ways, but God uses people like that for a great reason. Why? To prove his power and his might. The problem with today is they look to the worldly and the fleshly things that they look unto Saul back in the day when they called for a king. When God's word did not command them to call a king. They were to trust and obey God. They were to trust in God. They were to uh, rely upon him, walk by faith. My dear friends, but they didn't do it. They wanted them a king. So there came a time when they called Saul, King Saul. And my dear friends, let me tell you, he became one of the worst things and the worst enemies there to the church later on. And you say, how is that? Well, my dear friends, because he didn't follow after God, he fell short. Uh, he was a child of grace. Uh, but my dear friends, he became very disobedient. 
He loved his power more than he did God. He loved his, uh, his lineage more than he did God. And you say, what, what do you mean by lineage? Well, he wanted his children to be king after him. God didn't see fit for that. He had a young boy there, a shepherd boy, uh, by the name of David, who was ruddy. He, he didn't have a fair looking upon. He wasn't fair and beautiful and tall and head and shoulders above everybody else. But he was a ruddy looking young boy. He was a person that had a spirit of God inside of him. Uh, my dear friends, that's the way the old church has been. It's the way it's going to be. It's the way it's always going to be. It's going to be a small group of folk that get together in spirit and in truth where you find good old Baptist preachers uh, like Elder Bridgman Harris that came last weekend that is able to say, it feels like being at home when I'm there. My dear friends, is it that a blessing when God's people is blessed to hear the gospel message being preached and power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. It's not based upon all the abilities that we put upon men uh, to be able to preach the gospel, uh, but it's the simplicity. <laughs> it's the power of the Holy Spirit to bless them to do yeah. so. Yeah. <clears throat> Many years ago, when I was a young boy, uh, the Kegel family has always been special to me. <laughs> It's always uh, been interesting that I have found some member of the Cagle family at some point in my life that has helped be instrumental in my life at some point in time. Whether it's a distant cousin to Elder Bobby Cagle here or uh, Elder Edward, <clears throat> somebody was always instrumental in my life. And there was one that was a teacher in my life that was very instrumental in helping me get help because I had a learning disorder back in those days. And that teacher and her husband that was the principal of that Christian school was a blessing to me and my family to get me help to be able to get through those hard times. But later on, as the Lord blessed, there would be other uh, people like Elder Edward Cagle was a great inspiration and encouragement to me through my younger years and even got to be there at my ordination. Very precious memories. Elder Bobby has been a great source of encouragement to me, and I'm thankful for that. There's been other Cagles that have been that. I don't know why that is, but I see God's mighty hand being, uh, it being a blessing in my life. Amen. But there was times in which that there were people that was a blessing to certain people in scripture. And we're not going to get into details in that. But you'll find that there would be people that God would use for different individuals within scripture. There was Jonathan that was a dear friend there to David. <laughs> you remember that he was a dear friend and was a comfort unto him. You remember that there was times in which uh, there was Simon, I believe it was, that helped the Lord carry the cross to Calvary. Jesus Christ didn't need any help. If anybody could command that cross to be there, it would. But Jesus Christ taught that we are to labor and help encourage one another in this life. How many times is it that we don't do it? How many times is it that we don't do it? There was an encouragement to Apostle Paul when he's writing this opening text. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Let no man trouble me, he said. How powerful of a statement is that? He's had men come from behind and try and slip into his churches that he's labored. And they slip in like a wolf. 
And I'm sure it's people he knew, people he had been close to. At one time, they slip in like a wolf. We need to be vigilant. We need to be people that are ready and sober-minded. Why sober-minded? So you can catch it. A man that isn't sober or a woman that is not sober doesn't catch the subtleties. If you're spiritually sober, you're going to catch the subtleties. A spiritually sober individual is one that studies the Word of God, meditates upon the Word of God, understands the Word of God, understands the poverty, and understands how men and women work in this old world with their depraved natures. It's a person that understands and he's sober, spiritually sober. And my dear friends, Apostle Paul was a spiritually sober individual. An individual that loved the truth, loved God's word, loved what Jesus Christ had done for him. He understood that there was something special that day when he was struck down on the road to Damascus to persecute the Christians. He understood when he was struck down that when he was made blind and who had made him to be able to see, not only naturally, but spiritually. And my dear friends, he did it in the, for the sake of religion before, but he understood true religion later. He understood the truth later. My dear friends, how many times his people thought they understood religion, but they didn't understand religion. They understood heresy. They understood what wasn't the truth. But brothers and sisters, they were zealous in what they did. And they were earnest about it. But they were also earnestly wrong. Apostle Paul, making mention of this, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He realized that he had been sealed by the Holy Ghost. There was a seal inside of him that no man could put. Only God the Father could do it. Only the work of the Holy Ghost could do it. Only what Jesus Christ had done for him upon the cross at Calvary could do it. And he found comfort in those marks. We find comfort in our successes. We find comfort in our, what we gain in this life a lot of times. We find comfort in what all we build up in this life. Money, materials, vainglory, whatever it may be. But how often do you go and visit someone and they said, Lord, bless me so richly. I'm so thankful. Dear sister, I pastored at one time over Eddie Whitby's sister. Sister Francis, wasn't it? Yeah. Precious dear sister. You'd go visit with her. She didn't have much. Didn't have much at all. But she was a rich, rich sister. <clears throat> Struggled with some ailments. And I had heard people make remarks about her. The dear sister was probably more sound than some. Even through her ailments, she was an encouragement to me. Just like her brother, Elder Eddie Whitby. She loved the truth and understood who blessed her to be able to have what she had. And even through the old fleshly marks that we get and beat up by these old ailments we get today, she found a mark that comforted her. 
she was able to find that comfort. I'll never forget going into her house and as I went into her house and again, she did not have much, but she was very thankful for what she did have. Her most prized possession was the love that she had of the brothers and sisters up on her wall and cards that we had sent or others had sent in times past and she would put them up on her wall with tape. And she was thankful for the gospel. How sad has it gotten that we as Americans sit back in our sealed up houses And our fancy chairs we drive our fancy cars and we have so much is our true comfort found in the marks of our Lord Jesus Christ or is it found in our success of our children or our grandchildren or what we think of vain things in this life. I can only imagine what Paul went through, how discouraging it is when you have preached your heart out to God's people. And yet they believe not the word of God. When you're railed and you come through the front door and you are honest and you stand there and explain just what it is that you are, my dear friends, yet they would rather accept that which comes in through a window or a back door and dishonest in how they're going about things. Shame on them. Apostle Paul crying out, who hath bewitched you? Who hath beguiled you? My dear friends, they had been beguiled. They had been bewitched. They had fallen um, to the lure of Satan and the dishonest man, dishonest messenger. My dear friends, we have dishonest messengers today. They teach that your salvation is secure based upon your works. They teach that because of your perseverance that you're a child of grace. They teach all kinds of heresy today. They teach every manner of thing that they want. They even teach that all kinds of baptism is accepted within the church. They teach all manner of teachings is accepted within one place. It's called universalism. Brothers and sisters, hogwash. The Bible doesn't teach it that way. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God, Father of all, through all, in you all. My dear friends, let me tell you, that is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. They've got a thing out there. <clears throat> they show one Jesus Christ next to a Dalai Lama, next to something else, whatever it is. I don't care. There's only one I care about. Jesus Christ. Amen. But they had them all lined up and showing equal honor to them. My dear friends, there's one God. We've gotten into a pathetic shape. Pathetic. We think it's okay to accept this. It's okay to accept that. It's shameful that we 
We honor one living God. No, it's not shameful. It's shameful. What's shameful? It's we have allowed people to enter in through the back window, the back door, and we have allowed it, or we have opened it up for them to come in. Brothers and sisters, we need to keep the door closed. We need to keep the windows locked. We need to keep it all shut up. Why? Because they that enter in properly is going to knock on the door, ring the doorbell, be natural about how they're asking to come and visit with you. But if they come not with the truth, don't even wish them Godspeed. The word of God teaches we shouldn't even wish them Godspeed. If they come with something else than the gospel, we shouldn't wish them Godspeed. How shameful have we gotten? Man comes with a false doctrine and false gospel to your door, and you say, well, God bless you. No, the Bible doesn't teach that. You shouldn't even be going and allowing that mess in your house. I remember somebody years ago wanting to come to my house and tell all the manner of lies to me and my family. I wouldn't even let them in my house. And it was a church person too. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, we shouldn't receive such ungodly, unscriptural wickedness. You ought to be choosy about how you behave yourself. You ought to be choosy about how you uh, receive certain things, doctrines. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm not trying to be legalistic or talk about Phariseeism. I'm not saying that uh, people coming in to the church that has had a past should never come into the church. That's not what I'm saying. Because if that's the case, nobody in here should be in here. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's, that nobody should be in the church. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that when one comes repenting of their sins, asking for a home, proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord, the Son of God, and believing it, it wants a home in the church. That's someone that loves the Lord, that wants to know their Heavenly Father, that wants to know and walk after the things of God. But if somebody comes in here proclaiming that they believe in some of her uh, heresy, some ungodly belief out there, doesn't believe in the true living God, you shouldn't receive it, is what I'm saying. Light hath no fellowship with darkness. Back to the Colossians 1.22, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts, the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Bless us and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. How many times have people grieved the Holy Spirit inwardly because of doing something opposite of what they're supposed to do? I've grieved the Holy Spirit in times where I've woken up in sweats at night because I did something I knew I shouldn't have done and I get down on my knees. I said, God, have mercy on me. Forgive me. Help me, strengthen me. Some people say, Brother Brad, you sound like you're a weak person by saying this. Don't you know if you're a gospel minister, you should be standing up there looking like somebody uh, that doesn't have any kind of weakness. And brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you this, that Apostle Paul said that he's chief of sinners. If Apostle Paul could say he's the chief of sinners, then I could tell you that I've, I've grieved the Holy Ghost sometimes. And I believe Paul knew that sometimes he grieved the Holy Ghost sometimes. We've all grieved the Holy Ghost sometimes. Yeah. Uh -huh. We can grieve it. 
and you get down on your knees at night and you think, well, huh, Lord, have mercy on me, help me, strengthen me, hold me up. <laughs> My dear friends, there's some times that you feel beat down, drug out, <laughs> Uh, and I don't mean uh, pharmaceutical drug. I'm talking about where Satan, it feels like Satan's trying to drag you around with his old flesh. You feel beat up, battered and abused by this old world. You get worn out and you get exhausted. And my dear friends, there's some times where you feel like you've been beat up to the point where you've got mark scars and uh, blood dripping from your head from an old battle. <laughs> You just feel worn out and tired and exhausted there. Don't you remember, if, if we put this in a natural scene, I want you to think about this. You remember the old uh, Rocky Balboa movies when he would be fighting and people would be all excited and people get excited at that kind of stuff. They don't get excited over the spiritual warfare that we fight today. What they get excited about is the natural warfare. Oh boy, I tell you what, they'll be excited about somebody having a fight on in Timbuktu Church over there or the church down the road or some big city. They'll be excited about that. They'll be excited about all this natural things. They'll be excited about the fights. They'll be excited about the uh, the ball games. Oh, they'll take off church so they'll be at that ball game. They'll be excited about all that. But you get an old brother that's standing up for the truth. And he's preaching the truth of power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And old Satan don't like it because he's preaching the truth. And he's over there beating up on him. And others... Uh, Brothers are beating up on him because he's not just going with the flow of things, if you know what I mean. You don't see people over there encouraging him. You don't find the church members encouraging him. You don't find the people all cheering uh, for him. You don't find that. Uh, what you find is they're kind of embarrassed and they want to be like old Peter when Jesus cries was about to be crucified and they're asking Peter they're saying weren't you with him paraphrasing and he denied the Lord three times You watch a Rocky Balboa movie and you see them people over there saying, Rocky, 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 screaming. Was Peter over there saying, Lord, 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 praise God. We ought to be praising our Lord. We ought to be encouraged by the marks in our Lord Jesus. My dear friends, Jesus Christ went to the cross at Calvary for you. You remember that when Jesus went to the cross at Calvary and they took those nails and they nailed them through his hands and his feet and they pierced his side. My dear friends, there when he uh, <clears throat> presented himself to his disciples later on after he rose from the dead, you remember that there he presented himself unto them and there was doubting Thomas there. And Jesus Christ held out his hands and didn't even have to say that he showed the scars upon his hands. But Jesus Christ, of all people, could have been healed of those scars because why? He was perfect. But one reason he showed them scars. My dear friends, when we go to glory to be in heaven, this old sinful flesh is going to be done away with. And we're going to have a new body. It's going to be perfect. But our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I believe we're going to be able to see those scars upon his hands and marks upon his head as he showed them there to Thomas that doubted him. My dear friends, have you doubted the truth today in your life? Have you doubted the gospel minister? Have you doubted what God has sent to you? Have you doubted the truth? 
My dear friends, if you doubted that old man that stayed faithful to the truth year after year of his life, he's like the Rocky Balboas of the day, that had been beat up so much to the point that blood is coming out and he feels beat up and bruised. My dear friends, but we're talking about spiritual things. If people can get so excited about so many natural things, why can't they get so excited about the spiritual things? Why can't they get excited for what Jesus has done for you? And them. And as they spat on him and they beat him, they beat him worse than any man's been beaten, I believe. I believe that they put that crown upon his head of thorns and pressed it down upon his head and his blood dripped from his head. My dear friends, they cried out, crucify him there to Pilate. You remember that he washed his hands there. He wanted to wash his hands uh, of it. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you, he had the authority to not do it, but he washed his hands and he gave them over to his own people. And he said, cry out, crucify him, my dear friends. He's on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I'm encouraged by old Stephen as they beat him. He cried out, forgive them. As they stoned Stephen to death, he cried out, when is the church Rejoice in the old Baptist minister that has the marks from the old battles. You listen to old ministers like Elder Sonny Pyle's servants or others, and you find different writings from different ones or Oh, the bird from Georgia, and you see some of the scars and from some of the battles that maybe they had fought, spiritual warfares that they had fought. You thought you could find some things in their writings and see what they're feeling sometimes. The pain. We don't have that a lot nowadays because people aren't resisting the devil as they are. If you resist the devil, let me tell you, you're going to have some days that you're going to feel so down. You're going to feel beat up and you're going to feel exhausted and you're going to feel like you can't move. And the discouragement is so hard that you feel like you can't even muster up enough encouragement except when you open the word of God and you read it except when you listen to the gospel minister preach on a recording and you remind yourself and encourage yourself in the Lord, brothers and sisters, that's when you get your encouragement. I want you to think about the marks in which Moses probably received during the time in which that he was trying to labor with the children of Israel. I want you to think about maybe the marks that others have received through their service unto God. And guess what? It was well worth it to them. You look at the battle scars, spiritual battle scars, that sometimes that old <laughs> Jacob had suffered there with the angel wrestling in the middle of the night and he walked with a limp later. You say, well, that was physical. Yeah, sometimes you get old physical and sometimes through the spiritual warfare you gain in this life. You say, well, how's that? 
Well, sometimes those that are closest to you sometimes become your worst enemies because they crucify not the flesh. May we crucify the flesh as the word of God teaches us. Count it all joy to go through trials and tribulations for my name's sake. Jesus Christ has marked you with a seal of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that comforting? Amen. You have a hope huh, greater than any hope in this world. You have a heavenly home. You've been saved by his marvelous grace. You've been comforted. I'd like to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. Well, let's get back up to verse 7. And Paul's writing here to the Corinthians. He says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You said, I, you heard me say a while ago, some people might say, why in the world would you admit that you would, uh, <coughs> you get weak? That a gospel minister said, well, sometimes I've grieved the Holy Spirit. Well, guess what? What does it say here? My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So he, God used men in times past that had weaknesses, slow speech, uncircumcised lips, like Moses. People say, well, he's just giving excuses. I believe he's telling the truth, and he's being honest. Heaven help somebody tell the truth. I believe the ones that think so quickly that he's just being dishonest might have a problem being dishonest a lot. Ask yourself that question. Why would he lie? I think he's telling the truth. Let me tell you, God's grace is sufficient. What do you have? What do you suffer with? What do you struggle with today in your life that thinks and, and holds you back from joining the church? And you think, well, I'm just not good enough. <laughs> I've, been, uh, I've been baptized in some other order at one time. I should get to heaven. Guess what? It's not baptism that gets you to heaven. It's by the marvelous grace of God when you become baptized in the New Testament church, in the old Baptist, primitive Baptist church, is saying that you believe in what God has done uh, for you. And you, you go in obedience to be baptized with a proper administrator. That means a proper ordained minister of the gospel in the New Testament church. With the truth. And you go willingly and you go obediently. It's an answer to a good conscience. Scripture teaches. What the Lord says that baptism is an answer to a good conscience. Back to this scripture here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take no pleasure in infirmity. He's saying he doesn't take pleasure in it. It's not fun. 
It isn't fun. It's exhausting. Apostle Paul would know it better than anybody. Well, wait a minute. I take that back. Jesus Christ knew it better than anybody. Than Apostle Paul as far as a natural sense. <laughs> when it comes to one not being the son of God. I believe that man, he suffered a lot. Therefore I take no take pleasure therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities. I've said take no pleasure, but he doesn't take pleasure in it. He doesn't enjoy it as far as a natural sense. It's not somebody that he doesn't it's not something he enjoys, but he's learned to take pleasure in it for the sake of Christ, is what I'm trying to say. Forgive me. He doesn't enjoy it as far as the flesh is concerned because the flesh is at enmity with the spirit, but he enjoys it to the fact that he understands that it, it helps him, strengthens him and the Lord because he grows stronger to God. Let me correct myself on that. Yeah. And reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I am weak, then am I strong. Think about that. So a person that says, well, I'm weak. I can't do this. It's hard, but by God's grace, you can. By God's supernatural ability that blesses you, you can. Does that mean that you're going to be uh, just perfect? You're going to all of a sudden lose 50 pounds and you're going to be just gorgeous and you're going to be like Saul and he's going to look sharp. You're going to be heads and shoulders above everybody else. You, all you women, you're going to be the most beautiful women out there because God's supernatural power is going to bless you to have all these things to be able to get through. Absolutely not. That's not what they're talking about. God's going to bless you to have the strength to be able to get through. He's going to bless you to have your needs met. He's going to bless you to grow in grace and knowledge of the truth. He's going to bless you and help you and strengthen you. That's what it's talking about. Paul's encouraging them. I take pleasure. I take pleasure. Why? Because he sees those things are coming and he suffers them because of so much that he is doing right in the Lord. Satan don't like it. The world don't like it. God's people don't like it when they fall to the things of the worldly, vainly things. And crucify not flesh. We shouldn't be excited to bring such persecution on somebody and say, well, the Lord wants me to do it, you know, to be a buffet. No. It is better for a millstone to be hung about your neck and drown in the depths of the sea, as Scripture says, than to offend at least little ones, child. How many times have you seen people offend a child? I've seen it. I've seen people try and discourage children from joining the church. Not suffer the little children to come unto me, but discourage them. I've seen people be a discouragement to others, adults. I've seen this. And you say, Brother Brad, that's hard to hear. Guess what? It's the truth. May we not do that. May we not be a discouragement to people. 
I'm not saying no Grove is. It's a blessed thing to know that we have people that come into Oak Grove and tell me, Brother Brad, what a wonderful spirit I felt. I believe it's because of a group of people that love the truth and love God's word. And doesn't want to offend somebody. I believe it's people that want to serve in spirit and in truth. That's comforting. <clears throat> Back to our opening text. Ephesians, I mean, Galatians chapter 6, verse 17. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I'm reminded of Exodus chapter 21, that in Exodus 21, you go find that the master, that whenever that he had a servant, he was to be there for six years after the seventh year, he was to be set free during that time of the seventh year, uh, and after he had served those six years. But if he had gained a wife and children during the time that he was a servant unto his master, that he was to leave his wife his wife and his children there with the master and he was to leave alone if he so wanted to leave when he was let go. Why? Because that was part of what the master had gained during the time of his tenure there. That was Old Testament laws. Thank goodness we ain't in that now. Isn't that a blessing? We're under grace. We're under grace. That's a blessing. But see, he was to be, leave his family behind. But if he wanted to, he loved his family, he loved his wife, he loved his children, and he wanted to stay. They were to mark him. And you know what they did to mark him? They would take him to the doorpost, and they would take his ear. Now, this is what blows my mind today. Now, I want you to listen to what, what they did. They would bore his ear with an awl on the doorpost and mark him. And he would serve his master all the days of his life because he was pleased with his wife and his children and he loved them and wanted to stay with them and he was able to be with them. If he came in with a wife and children before his service, he could leave with them. But if he got the wife and the children after his agreement with the master and he stayed there for the six years, during that six years, he had to make that choice at the end. But if he chose to stay, his ear was bored out with an awl and he was to stay for the rest of his life. Now I want you to see Brothers and sisters, we've been sealed by the Holy Ghost. We have been sealed by the Holy Ghost. There's a mark there. There is a circumcision there. There's a change there. And we're God's children for the rest of our lives for eternity. Is it that comforting that God did a work that only man could not do, but he could do? God did that work. God saved us. Jesus Christ took the marks that we could not handle. He took the beatings that we could not handle. He had the marks upon his hand. And my dear friends, he took the afflictions that we could not take in this life. My dear friends, his afflictions was greater than any man's in this life. And that's the way it is in this life today. That when we bear the marks, and our bodies of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have that seal. We bear afflictions and persecutions and infirmities by taking the stand for the gospel. But when God looks at us, he sees us. He sees the righteousness through his son, Jesus Christ. He sees 
what he sacrificed upon the cross at Calvary. He sees his son dying for our sins. He sees his son that went into the grave and rose again after the three days and three nights. He sees where his son presented himself unto us. He sees all these things, my dear friends. And he did it all. Jesus Christ did it all for us. The work of the Holy Ghost did a work for us. God did a work for us. My dear friends, there's marks that we can take joy in. Are you taking joy in the marks that God has given you through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? We need to take joy in those marks and be more like Apostle Paul where he says there in verse 17, from henceforth let no man trouble me. Don't let me in trouble you. You've got great marks to take joy in. You've been sealed by the Holy Ghost. You've got comfort. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He, then he says in verse 18, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. We need to be thankful for what God has done for us. Amen. And count it all joy. And rejoice in those marks. And think about that a little bit more. Think about it. Thank you for your time and kind, sweet attention. Continue to keep us in your prayers. Amen.